Okay, so um, we are at 11 o'clock. We'll give it just a few more few more minutes. We're talking about a little bit about last week. And the truth is, I don't remember what the, what the context was, why I mentioned it last week, probably because the idea, no, I don't know. I don't know what it was, but if you remember the context. Um, so we are, uh, I think we're meeting next week as well. And then I think, uh, just some housekeeping. Yeah, we're meeting, we're meeting next, next week as well, but, um, and then we're gonna take a break. So please pay attention to the calendar, the announcements, uh, the army bar announcements. I kind of hope that we would finish the book of, of Judges before Rosh Hashanah so we could feel a feeling of completion. And um, it's gonna be left a little bit up in the air um, eh, because we're, we're certainly not done. We have probably two more after today. And then maybe we'll add another one just as a more of a, of, a, of a discussion of what we've learned and, and going back to the connections with uh, modern day state of Israel and Zionism. But, uh, but for now, let's, we'll do uh, chapter uh, 19. You decided what book you're going to do after Judges? No, but I think I'll take a break in any case, Ella. You know, it's been pretty full steam with, with okay. Danielle as well. And also uh, the, this, this mini course that I've been giving with Father Andrew which I've, I've got to end or I've got to end on time today because I got to pick up Andrew and bring him to the Federation for our one o'clock start there with um, a challenging texts of the of the New Testament. Uh, today, for those that know the text, we'll be doing the seven woes uh, of, uh, of Jesus in, in Matthew 23, one to 12. Well, a little bit after that as well, the woes towards the Pharisees. And, um, and if you aren't able to be on that you can get a recording let, let me know and we'll i'll send you the link to the federation and they uh they have last week's and this week's uh, will be on there last week's recording is already available okay so i think we're ready to uh to begin are there any other comments about last week or something that preceded today's study Okay, then you have the, the text sheet in the, in the chat box. If you're not able to access, let me know. Uh, there are some pictures, uh, some paintings for today's text, but uh, not nearly as colorful. And, 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 it, and if, I, if I would have sent that, that perhaps would have um, maybe taken away the focus. This is definitely by far one of the most difficult, and for some people, the most difficult narrative in all of the Hebrew Bible. This, this, is, this is where the disclaimer comes on, on, on the news report or the radio or the podcast that um, uh, this is not for sensitive ears. Um, maybe you've seen it. I, I, I'm guessing a lot of people have never read this story. It's not the kind of story that they teach often in Hebrew school and probably not in, um, in, uh, uh, in religious school, Bible school as well uh, in the Christian world. Uh, before we start, uh, 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 Sister, are you aware of, of, of is this reading in, in the lectionary at all, in the Catholic lectionary? Would you that's, know? That's a good question. There's not a lot of judges that comes up, like just for just just like that. Yeah. Um, there's there's only the one, the, the only one I can think of like that is is the one with, with the tree, you know, the olive tree and then the, and then the, the brambles and that whole story. But that's the only one that I can really think of, just like that. But I can I can look it up and see. Yotam's parable, yeah. And my guess would be that even if it is in the Catholic and the tradition Roman Catholic lectionary, or even in the Anglican or Episcopal lectionary, it's been modified in some. I know that uh, Father Green often would just say, "We're not reading that." <laughs> As uh, and, and then in many churches, of course, the church itself decides, or the pastor or, or the or committee decides on what they're going to be reading. Um, like in the Methodist Church, uh, Pastor Jane is doing a series now on uh, who is Jesus for me, for the uh, individual. And she's having a, a number of people speak. So I recorded yesterday and be doing it live for those who are interested at the um, uh, United Methodist Church of Palm Springs on Alejo with Pastor Jane this Sunday morning. Um, I'll be speaking about uh, Matthew 12, uh, the, the law of Shabbat and Matthew mm. 12. Um, yeah, so 
I, I haven't left Matthew. I, I, I spent last year dealing with Matthew quite a bit, but but it's there, there's still a tremendous amount to for me to uncover. And some of that is uh, well, that's not this this that's not this lesson. Okay, so let's go on then. So um, and, or let's begin. I shall say, Eileen, would you like to read for us, please? The first section, uh, remember we're in the section of addendums to the book of Judges. This is not, um, um, I, 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 I'm not sensitive enough myself to see that the language here is, is uh, late language. Uh, I know there's some parallels between our passage today and Chronicles, and that would, that is a late book, not just because it's at the end of the Jewish canon, but because uh, of the language as well. But that's what I've seen in some of the scholarship here. Um, so not only uh, is it at the end, physically at the end of the, and it doesn't really, there is no talk here of a judge. There's no charismatic or any kind of leader here. Uh, in fact, this is, this is the leaderless times. We are in the third part of, in those days, there was no king. So this is the the third, the third uh, session called in those days there were no king, but it's the second section uh, of, of two parts of the, or two to three parts of the addendum uh, at the end of the book of Judges. And we'll have to ask ourselves why somebody put this here, why fe somebody felt the need to add on this narrative. Go ahead, Eileen, one to two. We're in chapter in, 19, one to two. In those days when there was no king in Israel, a Levite residing at the other end of the hill country of Ephraim took to himself a concubine from Bethlehem and Judah. Once his concubine deserted him, leaving him for her father's house in Bethlehem in Judah, she stayed there a full four months. Okay, the word for concubine, the concubine translates the word pilegish. And this is known as the story pilegish bagiva. Uh, kids that had a good Bible education in high school in Israel, they get to this story. It's difficult, not before high school, I think. Um, and uh, so pilegish, what is a pilegish? Uh, there, the, a concubine here kind of, um, uh, here, it feels here that it's maybe part of a, of a harem. Uh, you know, the, the Persian kings have concubines or, or kings, but the truth is we've had concubine before. We had the two pilegshim, uh, uh, the two concubines of, of Jacob, right? Our, um, uh, no. Um, hello, help me out. What? Bila and, and oh. Zilpa. Bila and Zilpa, um, they, are, they are handmaidens of the main wife or one of the two main wives. And they're given to Jacob, if you remember in Genesis, they're given to Jacob as um, to, to make babies. And Hagar is kind of like that as well, though she's not, she's not at the same level. She's at a lower level, that is of Sarah. But it's a secondary wife, meaning it's not the primary wife, or in Jacob's case, primary wives. It is a, is a secondary wife who has limited limited rights. Uh, and the main thing probably is that the children, the sons do not inherit the same way that a, a primary wife would. Now, the laws of um, uh, the laws of adultery still apply to her because unlike the man who can have a number of women, the woman cannot have a number of men. Otherwise, she's a harlot. She's a zona. Uh, and, uh, and that's not what we have. We have a pilegish here. It doesn't say anything about this guy if he had another wife. It doesn't say. And, but we're meant, to, we're meant to understand right away, this is, it's not an equal, it was never an equal relation, of course, but it's less than the, less than the relationship between a husband and wife in biblical times. It's a, a, a slightly demoted wife and yet there is still an intimacy between them. Because what happens, right? It says that she deserted him. If you see in the Hebrew at the end of the first line, for those that can read Hebrew, it says, Batizne alav, which usually we would think means, and she 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 cheated on him, right? Tizne alav, she strayed from him. That's the literal, please notice to stray, but it means it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a technical term even for adultery. So, it's, but it's unclear. It might not be that that's it. And that's why the translation here is that um, she left him, she, she deserted him. Uh, now, finally, the interesting thing here is, is that I don't think there's another example in the Hebrew Bible of a woman deserting a man. 
it's in other words, the, or, or, or instigating or, or um, uh, starting the, the process of, of separation. That's kind of the man separates, sends a woman away. That's the what man, but here the woman sends herself away. She goes away to her father's house. And we'll begin to hear here echoes of stories from Breshit, from Genesis. The woman returning to her father's house, reminiscent of anything, anybody? Um, Rachel. Rachel. No. Sasha? Tamar. Yudan uh, 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 Tam, uh, Tamar, that another disturbing story in Genesis 38, though not as disturbing as this one, where uh, Tamar uh, is married to Judah's first son. He dies, second son dies, third son Judah doesn't give, uh, give, give the son to, or doesn't give Tamar to the son because he's afraid that she's a uh, a, uh, a, a black widow, a, 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 a woman who causes the death of her husbands, and she sends, uh, he sends her back to her father, right? Shri Chazra al Beit Avich, or Shri 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 al Beit Avich, go back, you widow, to your father's house. One of the cruelest uh, words ever uttered by one of our venerated ancestors of, of, the, of Genesis. That's one, that's a connection. We'll have to ask ourselves why. why. So that, be aware now, be looking for connections for the, in this story to stories specific, specifically in Genesis, okay? All right, um, what else do we wanna say about this? He's a Levite, does that matter here? Is, is it perhaps connected to the fact that there was this, this Levite in the previous story? Very much so, it could be they come from the same amount, uh, the same uh, collection of semi or fully uh, anti-Levitical stories where the Levites don't come out smelling so nice. And we're going to see this guy's not going to be smelling so nice by the end of the story. Um, the hill country, Beth, oh, uh, is, it, is it also uh, interesting that from Beit Lechem Yehuda, from, the, from the, the, the territory of Judah, also connecting us to, to Genesis 38, but also to what's going to come afterwards, because who is from Bethlehem? Question to people? David. David, right. And also, according to some of the traditions, Jesus, right? Because uh, which gospel you're looking at. And, uh, and so, um, so David goes from Bethlehem. Please, whoever is making the music, uh, mute yourself. Thank you. Okay. All right. So um, I think that's it. She goes for four months. I think that's all I want to say. Anything else that anybody wants to ask or comment? Okay, then. Um, did I, I saw John here before. Is John? Don't see John. John, are you here? No. So Wayne, would you like to read the next section, please? Three to four. Then her husband set out with an attendant and a pair of donkeys and went after her to woo her and to win her back. She admitted him, she admitted him into her father's house. And when the girl's father saw him, he received him warmly. His father-in-law, the girl's father, pressed him and he stayed with him three days. They ate and drank and lodged there. Okay. So now we're being introduced to a few key words, light vorten, that are in this section. That what, remember, one of the uses of keywords is to repeat a phrase or a word and, and, and to, to raise a theme through the repetition of that particular word, to, not just to connect the different parts of the story, that too, but to raise a theme for us to say, well, you know, what are we left with after reading? What's the taste in our mouth we're left with after reading the story? And one of the key words is in the, the first phrase or the first uh, uh, verse of the Hebrew. Um, it, it, he, goes, he goes to try and woo her. Uh, to woo her back is lidaber aliba. And Ella, what does that mean literally, lidaber aliba? To speak to her heart. Right. And we would say that in English as well, right? But to word, and this, the word lev, heart, is going to show up quite a bit. And be on the lookout for those who know him. Now, here's the problem or the, the, uh, uh, the disability 
the disability of not reading Hebrew. I'm not trying to rub it in. I'm not trying to be, uh, I, I want everybody to feel comfortable here, but we lose out in not reading this in Hebrew because the word lev, heart, appears time after time, yet because it is not, it, it's the English is translated in, it translates idioms into words that we can understand, although heart could have been used here, I think, and maybe is in other translations. Um, very often, the, uh, another word is used, like woo, to speak to our heart, instead the word woo is used. And that's for, that's inner, inner logical rationale of the translators of wanting to have something literary. Um, I don't have Robert Alter's translation of this part of the Hebrew Bible. I guess, uh, you know, I buy so many books and, uh, uh, and there's not enough, there's not a lot of room and, and the woman sitting next to me can certainly attest to that and protest that as well. Um, and I just kind of held off. I've got, I've got Alter's translation to the Torah and I have it to uh, uh, Samuel, uh, Samuel and Kings, I think. I don't have the whole thing because it didn't come out until after I would bought many of the individuals. But I kind of wish I did. That's something maybe for the next book to make sure I do, because in his translations, Robert Alter, who's a scholar of, of literature, Hebrew literature in general, and then set out to write this or to do this translation, he's very sensitive <laughs> and to word plays, you know, to key words and word plays. All right. Um, so I, I, all right, that's for the next time. Okay. Um, so he's, he, the interesting thing here is, I'm, I'm a little surprised every time I read this at the reaction of the father-in-law, right? Would, wouldn't we think that the father-in-law would side with his daughter, maybe to our own sensibilities? Like, you know, get the hell out of here. You're mistreating my daughter. So what do, can we learn anything from this? I mean, if this happened to you, women, you left your husband, God forbid, right? It happened. We don't know why. We, we don't, don't know why she left him. Oh, we don't know why. Okay, so um, that that's a that's a question that bothered the rabbis as well, which we're going to look at at, at, the, at the final at kind of summing up of, of today's study. So I have to wait a little bit for that. But um, we don't know why. But 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 Mariah, in, in the world that we live in, wouldn't we automatically side with our own our own child in the relationship? Except for my parents. My parents always sided with Sasha. That's clear. But, but and I mean, regular. Rabbi, unless maybe he, all he was concerned about was not having the responsibility of a mouth to feed in his house. Say, so go back to your husband and let him take pay for you. That, that's I mean, kind of what I'm thinking. Yeah. Yeah. Go, or you've got stature. You're, you know, you've got, you, you've got, otherwise, what are you going to do? You've got nothing. You know, these, uh, these stereotypical kind of situations. Um, in which the, 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 the parents are always worried about their child or the daughter who's not going to get married. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, and then we have another key word here. And the key word is from the root in Hebrew, lamed vav nun. Lalun means to stay overnight. From that, we have the modern Hebrew word, or it's, it's medieval already, is malon, place, a hotel, place where we stay the light. Um, uh, lina, sha'ot lina, or hours of sleep. Um, okay, I think that's enough of, of the parallels to modern Hebrew. Uh, but here we have it at the end, vayilonu sham, and they stayed overnight there. Uh, what, one of the commentators uh, points out, and I think I agree, that this is a euphemism for them sleeping together. Now, there are other words that could have been used, and we'll have another word for sexual contact coming up in the story but this term of them staying together uh, and and being implored to stay it, it it kind of is said just get back they are back together and it shows a certain kind of relationship right they argued she left him he went back to get her back and and so they're having makeup sex i don't know maybe perhaps that's where my mind goes in this particular situation but let's pay attention to this key word so two key words of lev heart and lalun sleeping over, staying the night, spending the night. Okay. Uh, Jackie, you want to read for us? Rabbi, let me, let me sure. say one thing. Before. I sure. pulled out a New American Standard Bible, and you know those darn Christian translators, they translate the word as tenderly instead of woo or love. So what's the whole sentence? What's the whole phrase there? 
Let me find it. He went after her tenderly? Yes. Yeah, that's even that's even further away because it, it turns it in, it turns it into a, an adverb as opposed to a, a, a verb. The Daber Ali is to speak to. Okay. All right. Anyway, again. Um, <coughs> I'm coughing too much today to read. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's great. Um, I, uh, Dan, do you have Alter's translation? I've asked you before to judges. You don't. Okay. All right. So something to something to to look into for next time. All right, or for the next book. Um, all right. Anyway, it seems like the problem is solved, right? He goes there, stays the night, they hang out together, and all right, let's go on to the next step. Mariah? Early in the morning of the fourth day, he started to leave, but the girl's father said to his son-in-law, eat something to give you strength, then you can leave. So the two of them sat down and feasted together. Then the girl's father said to the man, won't you stay overnight and enjoy yourself? The man started to leave, but his father-in-law kept urging him until he turned back and spent the night there. Okay. So um, remember I mentioned that, that uh, uh, pattern of three and then four that Zakovich spoke about and uh, wrote about in his, in his doctoral dissertation. We see it a lot. It's here too, except for this is a surprise. It's the three. We expect something in the fourth, but we're going to see still it's not adhered to. Sometimes a pattern is important or a model is important for us to know so that when the text strays from the typical model or from the usual model, we ask ourselves why. And we'll ask that in a second. But before that, with this paragraph, it is, is, is again, has those key words. The word for eat something in Hebrew is sa'ad libcha. Sa'ad libcha means to, uh, well, it means to eat, literally, but it, but it, it means to um, uh, eat to your heart's content. Would, could we say that? To eat to your heart's content. That's kind of what it means. Using the word heart there, again. So that same word heart, um, he speaks to heart, eat to your heart's content. And then um, stay around, he says, stick around and, and enjoy yourself. That your heart may be glad, or your, it will be good for your heart, right? So that heart motif is a, a, a word is it, it keep, uh, word keeps coming up all the time, as well as the staying over. And they stayed overnight. Uh, they, they stayed the night. And he says to them, stay the night again. All the, the stay. So the heart and the staying the night and, and, and the connection between that and the staying the night, is, I, I think we should understand as sleeping together as a euphemism for, for uh, being intimate. Rabbi? And, yes. This, this Bible one I said tenderly, it's annotated and they give alternate translations and it says to, to her heart. There you go. Yeah, there you go. That would, that, that would be a really interesting study to look at the use of heart. I mean, we 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 spoke before about you know the heart. The we say uh, we, it, it, uh, I feel it in my gut, or something. The heart loves, or in ancient Near Eastern culture, the kidney, or, or also in, in 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 biblical literature, sometimes it's the kidney that is the place of feeling, uh, or the place of conscious. Uh, different bodily parts that were used. That would be an interesting thing. To, but what to, it, that's interesting in itself. There's a lot of articles and, and maybe even books written about that. Um, the interesting thing would be to compare the English translations in that to see this tension between idiom and and the words themselves and and what you lose out. And that's why Alter did the translation that he did. Right? He has a book that explains why he the book that book I have the book explains why he translated uh, or why he did what he did. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so, so let's, let's go on. Uh, Roy, do you want to read? Okay. This, so we're, we're eight through five. nine. Yeah. Eight through early, nine. early in the morning of the fifth day, he was about to leave when the girl's father said, come have a bite. The two of them ate dawdling until past noon. Then the man, his concubine and his attendant started to leave. His father-in-law, the girl's father, said to him, look, the day is waning toward evening. Do stop for the night. See, the day is declining. Spend the night here and enjoy yourself. 
You can start early tomorrow on your journey and head for home. Okay. So uh, we talked about the pattern of three, then four. That's what we expect. That's what the biblical listener or the biblical writer was more sensitive than we are uh, until Zakovich pointed it out to us. Um, that's what they expect, the, the three. And then on the fourth, something's going to happen. But then this story says the fourth, it's about to happen. No, no, no. Then there's a fifth. And that's when subconsciously, at least, as the readers, we are meant to, I believe, and this is what Zakovich would teach, we're meant to, we're meant to say, uh-oh, something's wrong here. It's not the usual thing. Something's a little bit off with this story. Yes, Ella. Isn't it among Arabs a custom if a guest comes under a passerby not invited, he can stay for three days without answering any questions? I, I, I don't know. That's that's that sounds like the kind of thing that you would find that one that I would find in the late 19th, early 20th century commentators, mostly by British scholars that that have this kind of view of the world, uh, this imperialistic view of, uh, of Arab society. I don't know. I don't know. Um, is that something you remember from your from your days in Israel? I remember it from from when I was in Israel. Yeah. For three days you can stay without being asked questions. Yeah, I think in general, the three day rule is, it's not just in biblical literature. I think there's something I, we, we'd have to look around, but I, maybe it's just a, it, it's a, it's a Near Eastern thing, the three day, three times. Um, I don't know how, you know, in Jewish law, if you do something three times, if you, if you do interact with property of any kind, whether it's real estate or whether it's uh, the other, whatever, not real estate, the stuff you I'm thinking in Hebrew, the stuff you uh, take from place to place, property in general. Personal property. There's real, real property and personal property. So thank you. Real and personal property. So when you when you do something three times with it, interact, uh, and it, there's, in some cases, that's considered to be yours, right? There's things that you do three times. In, in later Jewish law, if you, if you, let's say, if you start to wear a hat for praying, right? Like in the ultra-Orthodox world, you put on a hat, or wear a jacket for praying. If you do it three times, I remember as a kid, they said, that no, you can't undo it anymore. That's your custom. Three times makes a custom. This idea of three times and then everything beyond that. So back to this story, the three times seems typical. Fourth, they're going to leave, but then, no, you know what? Well, I'll wait till the afternoon and uh, and then boom. There, there seems to be a problem, I think. That's what I want to say. There's a, there's a red flag is just shot up or a red light. Or a bell's gone ding, 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 ding. Now, if, again, if you're able to see the Hebrew, but I will point out that in the first line, um, he says he says to them, "Eat to your fulfill to your heart's content." But this year, this time, uses the the intensive form of lev levavcha, like b'chol levavcha or b'chol nafshicha, in in what we pray in, in the uh, the 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 extension of Shema, the paragraph of Shema Yisrael. Um, so. Uh, it goes from Sa'ad Libcha in the previous section to Sa'ad Livavcha, Sa'ad Na Livavcha. It's intensifying, but eat to your heart's content, but the same usage of the word lev, heart. And then at the third line of the Hebrew as well, the Yitav Po Yitav Livavcha, that your heart will be happy, will be glad. Um, the same thing with the word lean, linuna, stay here the night, the, uh, twice is used. Um, to, to spend the night. So again, these key words are emphasized, lev, the heart, and staying the night, staying the night in the house, I should say, la lune to stay overnight in the house. Um, and maybe, maybe also, this is the father's way of pushing them to continue to be intimate with each other. You know, take off another day, have another night. That, 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 that might very well be the, the simple meaning of the text here, that he's pushing them to be, continue the intimacy. Okay. Yes. Is it a common thing? I don't know. I've ever paid attention to this. Nobody is named here. No names at all. Right. So there are our stories. They're anonymous, which would lead scholars to say, well, that's why this is more, this is a folk tale, right? This is not about a particular person, although it is about particular tribes. We had B'nai Levi, and we're, and 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 uh, the the tribe of Levi, the tribe of Judah, and and that's going to be key to this story. So I think maybe I would say that it does. The names of the individuals are not important, but where they came from, 
they're, they repre they're representative of the houses of the families, the tribes from which they come. Well, let's go back to that at the end of the story. Okay. Um, so why don't you read, Sasha? But the man refused to stay for the night. He set out and traveled as far as the vicinity of Yebus, that is Jerusalem. He had with him a pair of laden donkeys, and his concubine was with him. Since they were close to Yebus and the day was very far spent, the attendant said to his master, let us turn aside to this town of the Yebusites and spend the night. But his master said to him, we will not turn aside to a town of aliens who are not of Israel, but will continue to Gibea. Ah, give ah. Come, he said to his attendant, let us approach one of those places and spend the night either in Giva or in Rama. So they traveled on and the sun set when they were near Giva of Benjamin. They turned off there and went in to spend the night in Giva. He went and sat down in the town square, but nobody, nobody took them indoors to spend the night. Okay, so I counted, uh, I, I think it's reflected in the English as well, but the spending the night, la lune, that's five times in this particular paragraph. Um, you know, to, la lune is to sleep inside in a house. The opposite of that is to sleep in the streets, in the public square. And that's kind of what happened. The emphasis on sleeping in the house, which probably means also being intimate together, right? Uh, uh, hit, pushing them to be to be intimate, then suddenly they're in a place where they can't sleep inside. They've got to stay outside. And what does that have to do? Or how is that connected to um, their intimacy? Um, okay, Yavuz. Uh, many people used to say it's Jerusalem. Their scholars are are. are divided amongst whether that was ever really the, the name of Jerusalem before, and it is in biblical literature, uh, but the, the name Jerusalem, Uru Salim, is documented already, I think, in the 14th century BCE. That's before any of our biblical literature was written, before David, right? Um, uh, it's documented in the El Amarna letters, I think. Um, and so uh, it could be that there were Jebusites that, and Yavuz is a, is a city in northern or north of there, far north of there, but there were Jebusites in that town. Whatever it was, the tradition was that Jerusalem, that city, and that, that's not far from Giva, right? Today, they're, it's, they're a few miles away, in fact, um, was a, an enclave, enclave of, of non-Israelites. There were enclaves of non-Israelites in the book of Joshua, it talks about how they didn't conquer the entire land. There were still pockets of resistance. And so Yavuz is that pockets of, pocket of resistance until David conquers it later on, right? In the time where there, when there is a king of Israel, not at this time. Okay. And so the tribe of, uh, the place of Giva is in the tribe of Benjamin. Now, interesting that we have this tension between Yehuda, we have Levi in the middle, the man, We've got the woman from Yehuda, and we've got the place here in which they don't find hospitality from Benjamin. Anybody guess why that might be important? Right, Shaul, the first king of Israel, is from Benjamin. David is from Judah, and there's a competition between the, the tribe of Benjamin and the tribe of Judah for the leadership, not just in the book of Samuel, right, uh, but also in the book of Esther in some ways. Esther, which is so far in the distance, still is in a camp that says, you know what, us Benjaminites, we're the ones who really should be in control because Mordechai is from Ishimini. He's a, a man of the tribe of Benjamin. Okay. All right. I, I feel like perhaps I'm am I going into too much detail. It's, I feel like maybe I'm losing people today. I, I apologize. So help me get back on track. Any questions or comments about that last section? I, I'm trying to put this in a broader context. And I, I defer to the erudition of so many people here who have who's been studying for years. And uh, I'm more of a beginner 
if I may categorize myself that way. What is, what is the motivation I'm asking uh, for these requests? How much does patriarchy play a role in this? Uh, in, in, in this whole scenario, things I'm asking myself those questions. Yeah, and, and as we will see as the story develops, it, it plays quite, it, it's a prominent role. Patriarchy here is, is definitely in the focus. So I don't want to give it away as we read the story, but uh, very much so. And, and but patriarchy is, is the focus of, of, of most of the biblical narrative. And there are stories that challenge that, like the story of Sarah and Sarah and Hagar that challenges the patriarchy of, of Abraham in a healthy way. There's a, a Rivka, Rebecca challenges the patriarchy of Isaac. We would say today, although in the end, it's still the formally, at least the, the Hebrew Bible is very um, patriarchal, patriarchal, patriarchal. <laughs> And, um, uh, and sometimes you have a, a case like in Esther or Ruth, those two small books, where the, the female uh, hero, which used to be called heroine, um, is, is, is central to the book, yet the be beginning of both those books begin with men and end with men, right? If you, I won't do it now, but you can, if you look at the first and last verses of both of those books, who are about women, and really <laughs> the women are, play the central role, um, the first and the last verse of each of both of those books are about men, because that was formally what need to, needed to be done. Yet there is this this subversive message we'll call it subversive right now of th thousands of years ago, which was more feminist. Um, so Roy, why don't you why don't you let's come back to that 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 question that you asked uh, at the end of the uh, of of what we read today? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay, David Friedman, turn off your opera. Turn down your, your sound system. Yeah, hold on here. Let me turn down the radio. Mute. Okay. And we're at uh, verse 16. 16, 17. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in the evening, an old man came along from his property outside the town. This man hailed from the hill country of Ephraim and resided at Giba, where the townspeople were Benjamites, Benjaminites. He happened to see the wayfarer in the town square. Where, the old man inquired, are you going to, and where do you come from? Okay, so the uh, in many folkloristic traditions, there's an old man, right? That, uh, but we'll see later on, Elijah the prophet is going to play the part of the old man in rabbinic literature. Uh, the old man who comes to bring some sort of message. And it's, the narrator <laughs> points out, but he's not a Benjaminite, is he? He's an Ephratite. And so, you know, th that probably is meaningful in the scheme of things as well. Um, you, you notice this, this section started with uh, a, a, in the evening, right? In the evening, uh, the previous sections or many of the previous sections were in the morning. So there's this contrast as well, in the morning, in the morning, in the morning. and now it's in the evening. It's the end of that day, that, that, um, that fifth day, right? The, the end of the fifth, fifth day, yeah. It should have been the fourth day, but they stayed that extra day. They come, so maybe that, that's what I meant by there's something wrong. That's a way of, of foreshadowing in that model that the three and four model is not adhered to. It's the three and four and opa, five, that that's a way of foreshadowing, uh-oh, something's going to go wrong. And indeed, something goes wrong here because they can't find a place to stay. But let's see the reaction. David, go to read another section, 18, 19. He replied, we are traveling from Bethlehem and Judah to the other end of the hill country of Ephraim. That is where I live. I made a journey to Bethlehem of Judah, and now I am on my way to the house of the Lord, and nobody has taken me indoors. We both have bruised straw and feed for our donkeys and bread and wine for me and your handmaid and for the servants, the, and for the attendant with your servants. We lack nothing. Okay. So it, it's not entirely clear, right? Who says that last phrase? Is it the, yeah. is it the, is it the old man who says, we've got everything for you? That would make sense. And he also says, Amatecha, your handmaiden. On the other hand, uh, well, yeah, I, I guess that's probably clear. It, it, it doesn't, it, there's no change in the, in the persona in the, in, in, in the, the, the text itself. It just, it, it, it doesn't point out that this is what the guy says, right? There's no, and he said, right? But um, 
and it, when he would, when the, the man from uh, uh, the Ish Levi, the Levite, he says, um, he, he gives the whole spiel, right? The whole Megillah, what, what's that? You know, I went here and I went there, but he adds something. What does he add? Something it wasn't part of the story yeah. until nobody took them. It's going to the house of the yeah. Lord. Yeah. yeah, like what's that? What what does that have to do with anything? Yeah, and it, it seems to me perhaps just a, a, an interesting detail of the narrative that uh, very often we talk about. We if somebody asks a question and we explain too much, and we add things. And and why do we add certain details? Why do we talk about when we meet somebody from Chicago? Oh, I know somebody from Chicago. And we go on to talk about it. Like, well, how is that really relevant to, to the conversation? Or, uh, you know, oh, yes, what, somebody's telling you about uh, how their father died and when you're sitting with them to Nihum Avelim to comfort the mourners. It says, oh, you know, my mother has something similar to that. And it goes on, you know, there's, there's too much talking, but he adds something, and, and what is that belay, right? When my point is, when we do too much talking, that's that's uncovering something that's inside of us that we need to get out for various reasons, for various sometimes unhealthy reasons. And maybe he wants to show his importance here. And I'm on my way, and yet everything, all every I've gone here and I've gone there, and I'm on my way to the temple, and this is what I get, right? That nobody takes me in. I, that's how I'm reading this here. Perhaps reading too much into it, but nobody takes me in. Because it, it doesn't have anything to do with the story, other than for him to show his bitterness, I think, and his self-importance at being a Levite. All right. Well, by the way, he can also be trying to explain, I don't need anything from you but space. I've got everything I need. That is if we that is if we understand the, the second part as him speaking, which yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, but then then it's hard to understand the, the rest of the story. So do you have the text, Gary? Do you have the text in front of you? Yeah. Why don't you read the next section for us? <clears throat> What's the number? 20. We're at uh, 22. Uh, I'm sorry, 20. 20. <clears throat> Rest easy, said the old man. Let me take care of all your, all your needs. Do not on any account spend uh, the night in the square. And he took him into his house. He mixed it. He mixed fodder for the donkeys. Then they uh, bathed their, their feet and ate and drank. Okay, so taking them in, reminiscent of Abraham, taking in the <clears throat> angels of another story that we'll see is even more, more present here. Uh, the, the term uh, in the previous section of gam teven the gam mispo, uh, the bruised, uh, whatever it was, the, the, the bruised straw and feed for our donkeys, is, uh, is a phrase that's right out of the story of Rebecca as well, the wooing of Re Rebecca. Um, I'm not sure that has any definite meaning other than this, this story echoes language and um, motifs and words, language and motifs uh, 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 from Genesis and maybe is trying to be like those stories, trying to be very much like a story from Genesis, ancient kind of history of, of ancestors that mean something, stories that mean a lot. Maybe that's what I would say about this here. Uh, why don't you go ahead and read another section, Gary? While they were enjoying themselves, the men of the town, um, a, depraved, a depraved lot, had gathered <clears throat> about the, the house and were pounding on the door. They called to the aged one, owner of the house, bring out the man who has come into your house so that, so that we can be intimate with him. Okay, so the, the paragraph starts off again with that word lev, right? Hema mitivim et libam, and they are uh, enjoying themselves. Literally, they are making, making their hearts glad, or they're gladdening their hearts. Uh, they're making their hearts better. Uh, and so that's the contrast. On the other hand, you've got these, 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 uh, this hostile crowd, b'nei b'li al, we don't know exactly what Blial means. Later on in Second Temple uh, literature, it will mean um, like sons of Satan, sons of hell. That's how it's used in the intertestamental literature between the Hebrew Bible and, um, and rabbinic literature. But it's used dozens of times in biblical literature. Uh, uh, the rabbis had two novel ways of understanding it. The word Blial is uh, one way was Bliol 
without um, a yoke. They were yokeless people. They had no rule. They did whatever they wanted to do. That's one way of uh, they understood it. The other one Bliyal is Bliyale, Bliyalu, without going up from, and it, what's insinuated there, they haven't come up from Sheol, the underworld. In other words, they're they're damned people. They're they're children of hell, and uh, and this connects probably to what what the language that is that is used in Revelation that and Father Andrew and I uh, looked at uh, two weeks ago, um, uh, synagogue of Satan or the children of, of of hell that's used also in the passage today. So in other words, this, the, the rascals at, 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 that would be a nice way of putting it. Um, ruffians, something like that. Uh, what did they say here? They said um, depraved lot. Interesting, Wayne. What is the what's the translation you have in, in your book? What how is they how are they categorized? These folks. We'll let you look. Anybody else? If you want to chime in. In the meantime, the next word that's interesting is mit mit davkim. It's the word lead folk to knock but in a, an intensive form that they were uh, usually understood they're trying to break down the door, they're slamming, you know, they're pounding on the door. Uh, before we get to Wayne, the, uh, the word, any, is this reminiscent of any story from Genesis? They, they translated, while they were making merry, behold, the men of the city, certain worthless fellows surrounded the house. Okay, worthless fellows. Oh, right. I have even worse. It's perverse lot. <laughs> perverse is, I wouldn't say worse. That's probably more exact. Certainly oh, yeah. The context okay. here. Certainly the um, context. So, what is this? What, what are we reminded of in this scene right now? These people are slam pounding on the door and say, We want the guy. We want to have our way with him. Yeah. It's when the, uh, the angels came to extract uh, Lot from God, uh, from Saddam, and uh, he fed them and uh, the townspeople and said, Bring these men out to us. Right. And what what purpose does that story tell us, that whole Lot story, where Lot is uh, going to be saved because he's Abraham's nephew from the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, Stone and uh, And while he's being saved, this is what happens. They try to rape the men. And then what does Lot say? Uh, send out my daughters. Say? Yeah, my yeah. daughters. Yeah. Don't, don't don't take the men. Don't take the men. Take take my daughters instead. And we all go, oh my God, how could he say that about his daughters? But people somehow uh, excuse that from thousands of years ago. Uh, and then in the end, uh, he flees the city as the city's being destroyed. His wife turns around, turns into a pillar of salt. They go up into the mountain. His daughters think that they are the absolute last people in the world. And what do his daughters do? They, they sleep with him. him. They seduce him one night after the other. That is a chunk. And what's the purpose of that story? More than anything else, who comes out of that story? The, Moab, the Moabites. The Moabites and the Ammonites. And that is a way, that's a way of demonizing those people in later centuries to say, oh, look at that. Who, look at there. Your mother was a, you know, that kind of stuff. Okay. Your father was. Um, and so the same usage of the, uh, while some of the commentators said, well, isn't that they're just trying to be like the, the stories of, of Genesis? Oh, uh, one of the commentators wrote, wrote, well, they only had a limited amount of motifs and storylines they could follow. They're just reusing. That's underselling this, right? This is meant to set us up for thinking, well, who's ever involved in this story? That explains why what happens in the future. We are enemies of Ammon and Moab because they are depraved, and we're, because they're just depraved people. And that goes back to an early story. I think that's the purpose here as well, which we won't be able to complete today because it has to do with the, the next, next, next two chapters as well. But let's continue with this. Richard, you want to read? Okay. So we're up to 23. Yeah. Uh, the owner of the house went out and said to them, please, my friends, do not commit such a wrong. Since this man has entered my house, do not perpetrate this outrage. Look, here is my virgin daughter and his concubine. Let me bring them out to you. Have your pleasure of them. Do what you like with them, but do not, but don't do that outrageous thing to this man. 
but the men would not listen to him. So the man seized his concubine and pushed her out to them. They raped her and abused her all night long until morning, and then they let her go when dawn broke. A, a horrible story that will get even worse, don't worry. A horrible story, but remember how the father-in-law, at least in my reading, my understanding, was pushing them to get back together. Well, sleep another night, stay in bed another time, you know, go at it, go at it, go at it. And then they go out and they stayed maybe a day too long. That was the the the, the ominous music in the background because it, it wasn't the pattern of three and then four. It was three, four, and then five. And they come and there's no place to stay. That's an even more ominous music in the background. And then uh, and then this is what happens, right? On one hand, this chesed, this loving kindness that this man shows to them, and yet um, and then he tries to protect them, but in the end. Who turns out to be just as much of a schmuck as the others? The man himself with his concubine. And, and it's tied into, yes, we don't know what she did or what, what, what he did for her to leave in the beginning, but what we understand is that it wasn't good. This couple was having trouble, as we would say, right? This couple, they, they, they probably needed some help, but he pushes her out and they have her way with her, this massive gang rape. No other way to say it. This is worse than the story of Dina. I know people go away from the story of Dina. Oh, no, look at what happened to her. Well, that was at least the others who were the enemies that were doing it to our daughter and, and that. But here, these are, these are our people, right? These are the, you know. So Also, it pushes her out. And that's interesting to me that it sounds to me like she was resisting. and said, no, I don't want to go out there with those, those rupians, those, those, those horrible men. You, you're my husband, protect me. And then he says, no, I'm gonna, and he shoves her out the door. Absolutely. It, it accentuates the, 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 the depravity of the man himself, right? So, okay. So Richard, why don't you read another section for us? Uh, 26, 28, third page. All right. uh, let me just move my screen here on the other computer. Okay. Toward morning, the woman came back. And as it was growing light, she collapsed at the entrance of the man's house where her husband was. When her husband arose in the morning, he opened the doors of the house and went out to continue his journey. And there was the woman, his concubine, lying at the entrance of the house with her hands on the threshold. Get up, he said to her, let us go. But there was no reply. So the man placed her on the donkey and set out for home. Gee. I, I no, told you it would no. get worse, and it'll get even worse than this, right? But I mean, the the absolute—he goes to sleep, right? Yeah. He wakes up. He says, "Well, we got to go. Get up." And in the, the contrast to that is her with her hand on the doorknob, kind of thing. She's dying with her hand, you know, she's struggling to get back. I mean, how many scenes like this have we seen in movies and TV of trying to get back but being deadly injured? And the and the lack of sen the insensitivity of, of this man treating his concubine like like chattel, absolutely, but at the worst degree. Yes, Ella. Sorry, you have to unmute. Okay, if he went to pick her up, why is he treating her so poorly? Or why did he pick her up in the first place? No, he didn't pick her up. I don't think that, that I think the reading is, is that she, she makes her way back to the house. She crawls home. She's got her hand up on the doorknob. He opens up the door because he's ready to go. It's time to go. And he says, get up. Yeah, but why is he mistreating? I mean, he went to get, get her in the first place. Oh, I see. In the beginning of the story, I went to get her. Um, you know, th that's, uh, I, I don't know, I don't have an answer to that other, other, other than the, I have an explanation for that, sure. Ella. Yeah. It's simple. He didn't care for her one whit. What he cared about was his own ego and pride. Here he is, a, a patriarch, and his concubine has the unmitigated goal for her to leave, to say to him, oh, I'm not going to stay with you. I'm out of here. I'm going back to Papa's house. And he's humiliated in his car, at his card club, or, you know, the lodge. But, but he only cares about his reputation at the lodge. But that's it. She originally, she was the one who 
who prostituted or sinned or whatever against oh. her. So that's why the English translation here was not that sinned against. That's why they went in this context. It means that he that what they're saying, this translation, probably others, that she left, she left him. She she initiated the leaving of him, but not that she slept with another man necessarily. Okay, so but we're let's wait and see what the rabbis have to say about why they separated. His name uh comes from the roots. Uh, Zona and she was a prostitute, or she, she... No, no, the other way around. Uh, Ella, Zona, the history of the, the etymology of the word Zona is that it means to stray. not mean to stray from the path. A woman who strays from her husband becomes with another one. And then the woman who makes a profession out of not having a husband and being with multiple men, that becomes the name Zona, okay. not the other way around. Okay. But she strayed, and supposedly she did something bad or whatever no we don't know that i think i don't think uh, that's why in the translation here um unless you if you if you go that way then you have a problem but if you if that's why the translation here says um and she deserted him unless you want to say that deserting him is is in the sexist and the patriarchal way is, is in itself a sin but let's go on to finish the story okay? <laughs> but it's, it doesn't matter what she did it's what he did that matters Right. Certainly, Whatever she did did not justify how we treated her. Right. And I think, therefore, Richard's, Richard's explanation is a good one. Yeah. But let's go on. So, so go ahead. And uh, Gary, read the last section here. 2930, it, it, the uh, justification is off, but you'll find it. When he came home, he picked up a knife and took hold of his con concubine and cut her up limb by limb into 12 parts. He sent them through throughout the territory of Israel, and everyone who saw saw it cried out. Never has such a thing happened or been seen from the day the Israelites came out of the land of Israel, and to this day, put your mind to this, takes counsel and decide. Okay. And so uh, I told you it got worse, and indeed it did get worse. Sends them out to 12, symbolic, of course, of the 12 tribes. Um, is this historical? Did this happen? Were there really 12 tribes? Scholars love to debate that stuff, but for me, this is a story with a lesson. And the lesson here is it never had been done before, but remember how we started this story? There was no king in Israel. And this is a story amongst other goals the story has to vilify certain tribes and certain cities like Giva. And let's remember, or maybe I forgot to mention, <laughs> Saul comes from Giva, right? So this doesn't seem to be a terribly pro-Saul, uh, Saul's family story, a pro-Benjamin story. Um, and, uh, and, and, and then the message is sent out. By the way, Saul does something similar in that when a horrible thing happens with poking out of an eye, the, the enemies, whatever, he wants to call the people of Israel to war. He takes, uh, I think, a pair of oxen and cuts them up into 12 pieces and sends the pieces up. Now, that it itself is a little bizarre and maybe disturbing, but of course, this is all the more so. Um, we're going to skip over Hosea now just because we need to finish. Um, uh, Dan, why don't you read... Uh, and, stop, and and we're going to take a, a, the, the passage from Babylonian Talmud, how they, one really fascinating passage that brings up uh, a lot of, <laughs> let's go ahead with it. Babylonian Talmud, Gitin 6b, Dan. Okay, Rabbi Eviatar is the one that his master, the Holy One, agreed with in his interpretation of a verse as is written with regard to the episode involving the concubine and give up, as his concubine went away from him, etc. cetera. Uh, the sages discussed what occurred that caused her husband to become so angry with her that she left him. And Rabbi Eviatar says, he found her responsible for a fly in the food she prepared for him. Or Rabbi Yonatan says, he found her responsible for a hair. Let's hold on a second. This is in the context of divorce proceedings. Gitin, not, not all the material in Gitin is about divorce proceedings. Some of it is about, for instance, the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. But in the tractate of Gitin, there, there comes up, what are the grounds for divorcing a woman, sending a woman away? 
And one of them has to do with burning the food, the, the cooking, the keeping of the house. So it's very specific here. Either there was a fly in the food or there was the hair in the food. Go ahead. And Rabbi Eviatar found uh, Elijah the prophet and said to him, what is the Holy One doing now? Elijah said to him, he is currently engaged in studying the episode of the concubine in Giba. Rabbi Eviatar asked him, and what is God saying about it? Elijah said to him that God is saying the following, Eviatar, my son, says this, and Yonatan, my son, says that. Rabbi Eviatar said to him, God forbid, is there uncertainty before heaven? Doesn't God know what happened? Why does he mention both opinions? Let's hold on for a second before we continue. No, no, go ahead, keep going. Elijah said to him, both these and those are the words of the living God. That is, both incidents happened. The incident occurred in the following manner. He found a fly in his food and did not take umbrage. And later he found a hair and took umbrage. Okay, so details about the story, but what's fascinating here, of course, is it lists the story from the argument between Rabbi Yochanan and Rabbi Aviatar, right, two of the rabbis in the land of Israel, and lists it to God is studying the story, and to say God is studying the story, we have some other interesting comments in rabbinic literature about what God is doing, and God accepting the, uh, uh, you know, Akiva, Rabbi Akiva, but here God is studying all the stories of the entire 24 books of the Hebrew Bible, this is the story that God is, is studying, which leads me to react, yeah, because this is the most problematic, and, and God deserves to be studying this, right? If we have to deal with it, God needs to deal with it as well. Uh, it's the rabbis showing their lack of comfort with the story, and then saying, well, you know, and they're both right. There was a fly and there was a hair, but it's different parts of the story in typical Talmudic fashion, which kind of makes, it, it, it makes this even more bizarre. Such a horrible story, and that's what you're doing with this? Let's go on. Ravi Huda says a different explanation. The man found a fly in the dish that she cooked for him, and he found a hair in her, but the hair was, uh, uh, the, oh, sorry, he found hair a hair in, in that place, that is, in her genital area. When he found the fly, it produced a reaction of disgust, and he did not grow angry with her. But the hair was a matter of danger, as he might be hurt by it, and therefore he became angry with her. There are those who say, this and that were found in the dish. The difference is that the fly was a result of circumstances beyond her control, as it fell into the dish on its own, but the hair was found in the dish due to her negligence. Let's go back to a second to what Roy brought up beforehand about patriarchy. Yeah. Like, you've got a story that challenges the idea of patriarchy. You've got a story that would suppose, that what you'd think would wake us up to be far more sensitive and say, and yet we've got this discussion in the Talmud. Now, is this, is this on purpose showing it to be ludicrous? Is this a form of, of satire or parody in, in the Talmud? I'd like to think so, but I'm not sure. I, I would want to read the other translation, I, Robert Alter's translation. Uh, I, I'm certainly not as familiar as some, but from what I've read, it, there was a level of authenticity. It, it, it did not seem as wooden as some of the translations I've seen. Uh, as, as, as I look at it, um, the way I look at translations of literature from one language to another, um, I, I, I like those insights. Second of all, I, I just became more and more disturbed as we talked about this. And I, I don't, un, I, I see so much of this from, from my point of view as allegory or projection or a points at which we uh, have a discussion and talk, but I don't, um, I'm not sure if we're looking, at, if, if our, this congregation is looking at it in an orthodox way, uh, I, I, I believe in this idea of a living Torah. And I also, sorry to throw all this stuff at you at once, um, but the reason I left Judaism or, is because I say Judaism left me many years ago and I could not be an openly gay man in 
the Jewish religion, but it came back and people, there were congregations that spoke to me. And uh, so all of those, that's part of the cauldron going on in my okay, brain so right I, now. I, 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 this, it, uh, this is really important stuff, Roy, because uh, we are about uh, critical looking at, at biblical sources and Talmudic sources. We are about um, uh, uh, self-criticism and we're about inclusivity. And, um, and so it's important to understand that I think you've been here for, for two other things. This is, this is not indicative of all the material that we cover, right? We, we do a tremendous amount and we did the whole book of Judges. This happens to be at the end of Judges. The way that I'd like to process it is, um, is, is it's important to look at translations and Alter's translation would be important here, but um, I am basing my comments off of the Hebrew text and I'm a student of Bible. It doesn't mean I know more than anybody else, but I know quite a bit compared to to who else is, is, is in this group. And it's not just about translations. It's about my ability as well to, to try to bridge the gap between the Hebrew text and our participants here. Uh, just to make sure that it's, that, that, that it's understood to everybody, the section from the Babylonian Talmud is hundreds of years after the, 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 the Hebrew Bible was, was codified, was canonized. And, and these are rabbis of a very different time dealing, having their own discussion of a very, very problematic story. Alter doesn't translate the Talmud. He only translates um, the biblical text, right? Uh, maybe there's cases where he does translate some Talmudic text, but this is used. This is a translation that comes off of the Safaria uh, website. And I believe it's based on uh, Dean Steinzal, Rabbi Steinzaltz's um, commentary. So if we get back to this for the, for the, for the, for the very end here, and this is all we're going to say because I've got to get to this other engagement, is that the story is the most, if not, one of the most, if not the most problematic narrative, that is story in biblical literature. In my mind, I think all of us, we don't think of it as a historical documentation of something that actually happened, although it could have happened, something like it could have happened. It's interesting that this particular type in folklore is not really found. The, the parallels that Gaster has in his book that I've quoted before, mythology and uh, I think mythology in the Old Testament, um, there's no real parallels to this. There's, the parallels are, are secondary. They're not, they're not to the story itself, which it, some people would say that shows it must have happened. I don't know. It's a story that definitely was included in the book of Judges to teach us something. One of the things is the issue of patriarchy and how problematic it is. I think that maybe the rabbis missed the point, or maybe they're being sardonic. Maybe they're being maybe it's it's a it's a parody. I don't know. Um, what we need to do is to reserve final judgment because we need to read the last two chapters of the book of Judges, which brings us to another purpose of these stories that are presented as happening in the days when there was no king in Israel, and that project onwards to what happened, written and added to the book of Judges, probably long after there were. No, long after there was no king in Israel, meaning after the destruction of the Second Temple. I, so, I please, mean, sure. so please sure. join us again, Roy, please, if, 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 if you can, if you'd like to, but I'm going to have to leave today, and, um, and that doesn't mean I don't love you, I love you all, and so does Sasha. Okay. Thank you, and I Bye, will everybody. be back. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.